our uh, program. And today, a very warm welcome to Dr. Roop Gursahani, uh, who is an expert in the field, what we're going to talk today. He's a, he's a consultant neurologist and epidemiologist at the Hinduja National Hospital, Mumbai. And his professional experience extends to many fields. He has not left anything untouched, I think. He is an honorary professor of neurology at uh, GMC Hospital, Mumbai. And he's also a visiting uh, fellow at the visiting fellow in epilepsy at the Cleveland Clinic of United States of America. And he is he is also an, a neurologist for the Ramakrishna Mission Hospital, Mumbai. Like that, it goes on and on. He, he has not left any hospital in Mumbai untouched, I think. And then next important thing for today is that he is one of the member in the steering committee of ELICIT, which is what we are going to deal today. He is a pioneer and he, he, he gives the principles and guidelines for how this has to be done for the whole of India. So what a privilege and pleasure to have a person who does that for all of India to teach us today. So we are really gifted to have someone like you, Dr. Rup Gursahani. The floor is yours. Please enlighten us. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Okay. So uh, just give me a couple of minutes before I start slide sharing. What has happened is that uh, um, I just came back from the hospital and I'm kind of flipping through my slides to make sure that I have the... No uh, worries at all, sir. Two minutes. Go. And uh, I am at the prom moment attached only to Hinduja Hospital. So all of those multiple attachments were in the past. <laughs> just a minor correction. And... Uh, um yeah you can see can you see my slide yes sir it's perfect good to go in slide should be okay right so basically uh, today we'll discuss end of life care with clinical aspects of death and dying and i'll be you know, taking you through some uh, patient uh, stories as well though i'm sure there must be a case presentation at the end of it but uh, uh, well i like to show stories to illustrate what I'm talking about. Remember that uh, when we are managing uh, seriously ill patients, uh, predicting and prognosticating is one of our major jobs. And uh, uh, I think these are the three principles that I follow in acute illness. Well, you do your best, obviously, until uh, you know things are not turning around. Chronic illness, as always, you have to know your limits. And in neurocritical care, uh, we have to understand legal and ethical boundaries. So I'm going to talk today about four patients who did not die in an ICU. And that's important to know because uh, nowadays, all our patients die in ICUs or in hospital. Right? So the first is this gentleman who was 81 years old when the story began. Uh, in January 2014, he first began to complain of forgetfulness, first diagnosed to have um, uh, uh, early dementia, and was treated for mild depression, because these two things often go together. And, uh, well, he himself asked the neurologist, what is going to happen next? But there was no meaningful discussion. He'd been active socially, but no physical exercise. And uh, he was a pretty prominent person. So about two years before he'd worked on multiple boards and so on and he had begun to figure out that things were not work, uh, I mean it was things that had to be wound down and he had resigned from each of them and as always uh, the old couple were living here the children were in the US and you can see his decline beginning from this point in 2015, he could maintain an independent daily routine, but simplifying things. There was this tendency to repetitive questioning. By 2016, he started needing supervision. Uh, his wife needed to supervise his self-cleaning, and he used to shadow his wife constantly. And in 2017, behavioral issues came up. 
So he needed prodding for bath, clothes change. And uh, uh, once in the night, he wandered outside and almost got lost, except that the building chokidar saw him going out of the main gate and pulled him back in. And the wife was, in fact, getting so exhausted that she needed admission for ischemic heart disease. 2018 January, he came in with uh, altered sensorium due to a urinary tract infection, found to have a hyperfunctioning detrusor, discharged with a suprapubic catheter. Now mobile in the house, but needing full supervision. And now the wife asked the neurologist, what is going to happen next? Well, this is expected with old age. Um, and she obviously later said that we were never told about all of this. In 2018, December, he came in with another bout of altered sensorium, this time due to hyponatremia. And at this point, when he was discharged, he had dropped further, now completely bedbound, nearly mute, and all activities dependent. Uh, barely a month later, he came in with recurrent generalized seizures, uh, which were easily controlled with medications. But as often happens, he got intubated. There were no fresh changes, no obvious metabolic causes. He could be weaned off the ventilator. But again, for unclear reasons, a tracheostomy was placed. And it was only when the time came to decide about putting in a peg, which is when our palliative care team came in, and now there was a prolonged discussion and he was finally discharged for home care on day 28 of this admission. When he reached home, he was effectively in a persistent vegetative state. And the US-based son who had now been around actually asked, couldn't we have involved palliative care earlier? How much earlier? Question mark. And then he was being managed at home with a phone liaison, uh, developing bed sores. And in March, he had an episode of vomit during which he aspirated and he passed away. So remember the story and contrast with it with this second story. This is a gentleman who, again, a little younger than the earlier guy, uh, again, living in Mumbai with wife, only daughter in the US, develops intermittent constipation, blood in the stool, Gets a colonoscopy, identifies a moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma in the sigmoid colon. And he was then sent off to oncology and oncosurgery. And he got a left hemicolectomy. And as so often happened, this was a this is something that uh, these are words that I'll not forget. Uh, he was speaking about the post-operative discussion with the oncologist, and he said the doctor just refused to look at into my eyes. He was talking to my daughter. Mary Betty se baat kar. So, and this is something that we often do. Don't forget that. Uh, six months chemotherapy were well tolerated except one episode of uh, sensory neuropathy. And uh, he seemed to have done well. Now, one thing that had happened in between this is that his US-based grandson just after the first chemotherapy, actually insisted, identified, and directed him to a palliative care physician. And although he continued to follow up with the oncologist, uh, there had been some discussion about what if things did not go well. So in August 2017, uh, sorry, in November 2017, a PET CT was scheduled and it turned up extensive metastasis. Uh, expected survival four months. The oncologist offered palliative chemo with uh, targeted therapy, which offers a median survival of eight to 10 months. Best case is 24 months. Uh, given the discussion that he had already had, he said no. Chose the palliative care option. A palliative care team did a home visit and hospice care was set up at home to manage his symptoms. And uh, literally the family came together because his grandson, who had actually got a new job, got two months of leave and flew to Mumbai to take care of his nana because everybody knew what the time scale was like. And uh, they he prepared, he and the palliative care team prepared the gang, old people, old couple. 
by may 2018 uh, he was rapidly declining and uh, he literally held on until his daughter reached and after greeting her passed away the next day keep this in mind and let's move on to a third story uh, does anybody have any questions about these stories two stories do you think there are any conclusions you can draw from them what do you think about these two stories do they tell you is there a message anything in the chat box the psychosocial care and family support was better in the second second one um that's a very good comment but why do you think that was because uh, in the first uh, scenario uh, he was all alone and no support was there so he, he continuously deteriorated and in the second story palliative care team along with the family support was there and he feel happy um, he felt okay. happy basically mm, yeah i mean palliative care is important but remember one thing the most important is the patient uh, the central player is the patient in the first story the patient gradually lost his personhood lost his autonomy he was not prepared for his impending loss of autonomy in cancer the patient was conscious literally till the end and he retained his autonomy he made his own decisions that was the key difference uh of course it helped that in the second case prognosis was explained preparations were made uh but if you look at the fact that dementia is a terminal illness that could have been that that should have been done 3 to 4 years before when the story began now that is the basic problem that we face when we are taking uh when palliative care takes on neurology oncology in that sense becomes a much simpler easier uh cup of tea you know it's it's like uh, ready mix all that you do do is add morphine and a little bit of sim- sorry <laughs> compassion sorry for the palliative care people and and cancer biology takes all the decisions whereas uh in neurology or in non oncology palliative care uh there are ethical there are other decisions to be made things are not so simple right so these were two ends of the spectrum this third one is somewhere in between and then we'll have a fourth case which is actually really different so this was 80 years old lady in november 2014 she moved to nasik that's uh, near mumbai with her 87 year old husband to live near her only dot she used to live in mumbai and uh, because she had poorly controlled diabetes on insulin and had been getting episodes of hypoglycemia and dk although she was otherwise normal her daughter insisted that they had to come and be next to her because it was not possible for her to keep coming into rescue her settled into a new home uh supported by servants and so on and then uh about a year and a uh, into april 2016 she first had a febrile diarrhea illness collapsed needed admission but discharged in fights october 2016 fracture neck now needed a hip replacement she had transient delirium but recovered well and uh, began to walk with a walker okay so 80 years old now 82 uh then her husband who was now i, I think at that stage close to 90 Uh, in march 2017 he had just 3 days of vague chest pain and uh, when he finally got to hospital it turned out to be lobar pneumonia and sepsis within 24 hours he was in multi organ failure uh but his wife uh confirmed that the old couple was very clear about dni do not intubate it do not resuscitate and he passed away 48 hours after it. why did this happen this happened because both husband and wife had spoken to their daughter after the wife's admission for fracture neck femur and made it clear that there were going to be no heroic measures in fact they said their body should be donated to the medical college 
so even though they didn't know that things were going to go wrong but they anticipated that things could happen and uh, as it turned out her granddaughter came in to live with uh, a patient and uh, that that actually cheered her quite a bit until about the beginning of the next year I remember that she had badly controlled diabetes and now she developed a uh, multiple superficial soft tissue abscesses she needed admission twice for iv antibiotics but by march 2018 it was obvious that the these were not working and she asked what is happening to me she was told medicines are not working she made a clear decision i will not go to hospital again and she, she in fact she was pretty stoic so she would not even take any painkillers stronger than paracetamol even when the dressings was being done and you will wonder how could in this day and age somebody die of just superficial soft tissue abscesses but that's what happened by end april 2018 reduced activities in bed most of time needing basic activities of daily living to be supported uh, except that she could eat and her intake of food and water started to decline second week of june 2018 she delirium began she started to moan even on turning over on bed vital started to go down she became incontinent 3 days later she stopped speaking at this point she was delirious but able to speak she stopped speaking and she stopped breathing later the same day right so if you look at these three deaths if you look at cancer death you have a defined trajectory uh, sorry give me a minute i need to do something so right if you look at cancer death you have a defined trajectory and prognosis uh if the prognosis is spelled out admissions can be avoided and patient and family retain control if there is transparency whereas for non oncologic uh neurologic or non oncologic death the trajectory is erratic often prolonged recurrent admissions may be unavoidable and if it is neurologic there's an early loss of personhood so you end up very often end up with expensive and avoidable icu care at the very end for this we have to understand the disease trajectories at the end of life uh there are four that have been identified i mean this came out of a landmark paper uh, almost 20 years ago which looked at uh the random sampling of people above the age of 65 the, that that is the us medicare sample and they captured 92% of all deaths and they were able to put them into one of these four trajectories so one is sudden death the second is terminal illness typically cancer uh the next is organ failure and the last is frailty um let's look at each of them in turn now if you look at sudden death right so somebody is going along merrily down his road and he is hit by a truck a bomb a bullet or whatever or a clot and they die right this is relatively uncommon after the age of 50 years all people with risky behaviors young soldiers young terrorists <laughs> advertising agencies uh, executives smoking too much acute myocarditis all of this generally finishes by the age of 50 years everybody who crosses the age of 50 or 65 the chances of them dying suddenly are well under 10% about 7% or so and you have to have a lot of punya a really a lot of punya to at the age of 83 or 84 just go suddenly uh our long haired president passed away had a heart attack while he was actually giving a lecture and he was gone to work with So as i said it takes a lot of punya to get that what about uh, terminal illness and terminal illness typically means cancer though it can also mean something like motor neuron disease these are people who stay at a fairly high level of functioning they will get one chemotherapy they may even get a second chemotherapy and then at a certain point tumor burden 
begins to climb and goes out of control. And this becomes the waterfall trajectory because our prognosis is directly related to tumor bird. And remember what I told you in this story, it is cancer biology that makes all the decisions. So with a reasonable knowledge of what you're dealing with, you can actually predict when the water will fall. So that's why the waterfall trajectory. Now, this typically is affects people in their uh, late 50s, early 60s, and it accounts for about 20% of all deaths, though people think that the number is probably dropping. And you know who the VIP here is, our former defense minister and the ex-chief minister of Goa, Mr. Parikar. Uh, a little later in life, people in their 70s uh, develop with bad diabetes, blood pressure, develop organ failures of various kinds. Uh, their functioning is not good. They keep getting into crisis. This is called a looping trajectory, come into hospital, come out, but declining. And they eventually pass away in a crisis. Right? The picture here is the augur man, because, uh, 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 of the ordinary man, because... Uh, VIPs get transplants. Right. A little later, as we get older, in the 80s and 90s, we reach it at a reasonably low level of function. And we keep dwindling and dwindling and dwindling and dwindling until finally death comes. So we call this the dwindling trajectory or the frailty and dementia trajectory. And this will take about 50% of us. Old age, frailty, dementia. Remember, Atal Bihari Vajpayee lost the 2004 elections and we didn't hear of him. Literally, we didn't hear of him until he finally passed away in 2018. So, in neurology, uh, uh, um, the, the rapid decline trajectory is uh, uh, also seen for instance with the uh, uh, metastatic disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, this entry, re-entry or looping trajectory, we also see it in epilepsies. And this prolonged dwindling trajectory, we see it in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. But there's one more trajectory that comes up in neurology, which actually is an artifact of modern critical care. Somebody who has <coughs> sudden neurologic impairment, it could be stroke, it could be hypoxic ischemic, which means they have suffered a, uh, a cardiac arrest, but resuscitated, or they have bad traumatic brain injury. They, in previous years, they would have died, but critical illness picks them up and they end up in this trajectory, which is somewhere akin to this. Um, and obviously, there are varying periods over which they may die. Uh, it's important to understand one responsibility that medicine has dropped over the years, and that is to foresee and to foretell the future. Uh, it is it has been our responsibility since the time of Hippocrates, but for various reasons, uh, we no longer seem to be doing it very well. One of the reasons is that our patients are more empowered, and they don't like oracular judgments like so-and-so will be dead in 10 days or whatever. They don't like that. They want us to prognosticate uh, honestly, accurately, but also combine a certain amount of optimism. And you can actually do that with communication skills. I'll, I'll come back to this point a little later. So the point that I'm making is that most deaths can be anticipated, though a minority less than 10% are unexpected. And if you take this into account, then it is important for us to make sure that more people live and die in the place and manner of their choice. But for that, they have to know their choice. Uh, let's understand the boundaries of end-of-life care. Uh, remember that palliative care is applicable to all serious health-related suffering because it assesses needs, it sets goal of care, and manages all symptoms. And effectively, you can start at dying. End-of-life care uh, and terminal care tend to be terms that are better defined, perhaps, in retrospect. Actively dying is a clinical judgment, uh, which 
is based on physiological parameters and is typically irreversible, right? So uh, when we look at these terms, uh, typically these are applicable when we know that an individual is not going to recover with available treatment. And if you look at, remember my patient three, even though she, all that she has was had was superficial abscesses, we knew that this was not going to respond to standard treatment. And sooner or later, she would pass away with sepsis, which is what eventually happened. So uh, when the second admission failed, and when she decided that she would not go to hospital, that was when terminal care began for her. Now, um, for the patient with dementia, actually, it began at the time of diagnosis. Now, can you recognize terminal illness? Right? So there are four methods of doing this. And if anybody is interested, you can look up something called the gold standards framework. And this material is all taken from there. There are four triggers that we use. One is called the surprise question. The second are general indicators of decline, which are... Uh, clearest for cancer, but can also be clear, say, for instance, like the old lady with uh, uh, multiple uh, abscesses, then specific clinical indicators related to certain conditions and decisional. When you change focus from only disease-directed therapy to only comfort care or both together. And uh, this could even be, say, somebody with uh, chronic renal disease saying no dialysis. So the surprise question is actually often a surprise even for people uh, outside palliative care who are not aware of this. It is just that. Would you be surprised if this patient were to die in the next one year? And if you say no, this has to be an intuitive answer. Uh, because what you do is put together clinical features, comorbidities, social and other factors to get a whole picture of deterioration. Uh, for instance, the fact that the old lady say that, said that she was not going to the hospital, that's, that would be a very important thing to understand. And the accuracy for this is, uh, can touch 80% in oncology. In non-oncology, it's a little lower, but it has been statistically proven. And uh, I think it is one of those things that if you work at it, and uh, uh, try and uh, pin your intuition down, you will actually find it improves with experience. Then there are general indicators of declining. That's trigger number two. Basically, this means somebody whose uh, functional performance is declining, less able to take care of themselves, typically in bed or chair more than 50% of the day and reading more assistance in most activities of daily living. Uh, it needs uh, systematic assessment. There are various scales that you can use, like the Kar Karlovsky performance scale and uh, Bathil index and so on. But uh, uh, And it's most reliable only, uh, in, uh, mainly in malignancy. But anybody who spends, with a malignancy, who spends more than 50% of the day in bed or chair, uh, probably has a prognosis of three months or less. Again, I'm repeating, this is most accurate for cancer, but uh, maybe perhaps um, a little less accurate, but still a significant marker even for non-oncology. Uh, another indicator of decline is comorbidity. So uh, anybody who has one illness and then another, so... Uh, diabetes is something that we often take for granted that, well, uh, typically nobody should die of diabetes. Uh, but if you remember, bad diabetes, multiple abscesses, two. The same thing if you combine, say, chronic heart failure or CKD, again, the same thing. What about advanced disease? If somebody is unstable, symptoms are increasing, getting more breathless, again, you need to. Uh, watch out for uh, rapid decline. And if somebody starts 
uh, stops responding to treatments. Um, one of the examples is somebody with COPD or ILD who now requires home oxygen. Uh, numbers that you can watch for are uh, weight loss, more than 10% in six months. But one thing that I often look out for is the serum I'll do. And anybody who's getting admitted repeated. So uh, in chronic heart failure, we take more than three admissions in one year. But I would say that anybody, anybody who gets admitted more than twice in six months, uh, you need to start thinking about what is coming next. Uh, we also have something called sentinel events. Now, the sentinel event can be uh, something that doesn't necessarily seem to affect the system in question, but is a marker of a declining organism. So a serious fall. Obviously, if it causes a fracture neck femur, that's really serious. But even without that, somebody who's otherwise going along really well and falls down badly enough to get multiple contusions, so that's important. Or the loss of a spouse. These are sentinel events. Uh, in terms of diseases, as I said earlier, uh, this is most specific for uh, cancer. So somebody who has metastasis after initial therapy, stage four disease, multimorbidities, no further treatment possible. And if that person spends more than 50% of the time in bed or lying down, the prognosis is about three months or less. When you look at organ failure, uh, these indicators tend to be rather erratic, unpredictable, and literally all over the place. So I'm not going to read through these in detail. Again, if you look at this, if you click on gold standards framework, you will get this whole document and you can look at it at leisure. Uh, in fact, if you look at heart failure, repeat admi admissions, uh, they've actually put down a figure of three admissions in six months. Uh, additional features like hyponatremia, high VP, declining renal function, so on. Um, similarly, for chronic obstructive disease, uh, permanent, uh, for uh, uh, lung disease, for kidney disease, for liver disease, and obviously, the more complex is neurology. Uh, you have different indicators depending on the progression of different diseases. And all of this uh, makes prognostication outside oncology, in that sense, somewhat complex. But it is not as though it is not possible. I'm flipping through these slides because uh, otherwise it'll take just too long for us to get through this. But remember that even in old age, uh, you can pick up indicators like this slow walking speed it takes more than five seconds to uh, walk four minutes. Um, the time that they take to stand up from the chair, walk three meters and turn, turn back. And if you see that declining, you need to watch out for that. So in all of this, uh, in neurological conditions, especially when it is rather complex, the issue that comes up is, is the fourth trigger. And the fourth trigger is decisional, where actually a decision is made not to go any further, not to provide any further interventions. And this can be decided if there's progressive deterioration, symptoms which are complex, uh, persistent speech and uh, swallowing problems. Typically, both of them happen together. And when that happens, you have to decide how far will you go. So when I say decisional, I mean that medically, in terms of intensive care, we now have the means to keep the body alive indefinitely should we choose to do so. So let me give you three pictures and then a fourth. In 2018, three nonagenarians, meaning in the 90s, uh, who were pretty important people, passed away. In April 2018, it was Barbara Bush. In 
November 2018, it was George Bush, her husband. And in between the two of them was Atal Bihari Vajpayee. If you look at pictures of these two, they died in their own beds, literally in Darbar. So there were dogs, cats, grandchildren, friends, people around them. And they passed away in state. We don't have pictures of uh, Queen Elizabeth's uh, last hours and days, but I'm quite sure it was like that. She passed away in her own bed at home. Atal Bihari, on the contrary, died on something called extracorporeal membrane oxygenation in the AIMS ICU, which means his heart and lungs had failed and they were taken over. And he passed away the day after a big man made a big speech. So maybe that was the reason. Whatever it is. Lata uh, Mangeshkar, well past 90 when she got COVID, she came out the first time. She was extubated. And when she declined again, I can't believe this, that she actually, those, those incomparable vocal cords were ravished again. So the rule is that if you are an Indian VIP, you're condemned to torture before death. Now, if you look at all these situations, can you predict mortality uh, in the medium to long term. And actually, you can. So uh, this, of course, is one paper. There are at least another five, six papers in the last uh, decade and a half, which I've looked at this in detail. Uh, this We call this the Walter Index. If anybody is interested, I'm happy to share the original paper also. Uh, and these guys, they looked at... Uh, a fairly large cohort, I think it was almost about uh, 2,000 plus patients, looked at multiple variables and put together a score. So uh, the activities of daily living that they have listed here are the ability to transfer from bed to chair, to eat, to uh, take care of your toilet and to wear clothes. And if somebody needs assistance with uh, and also one more, I forget which one. So if you need assistance with all of these, then it means five points. But if you need assistance with four or less, then the number is less, about two points. Uh, what if they have congestive heart failure? Two points. Metastatic cancer obviously gets the maximum score, but a dropping serum albumin, a rising creatinine uh, also get points. And when you put these points together, uh, if you look at it an individual, and you can easily think of, say, an 80-year-old gentleman who needs assistance with all activities of daily living, also has congestive heart failure. So 2 plus 5, 7 plus 1, 8. Anybody who has more than 6 points has a greater than 60% chance of mortality in the following one year. Now you will say, uh, well... Uh, so-and-so's uncle, the doctor said he was going to pass away and he lived for another three or four years. Sure, we remember outliers, but you remember if somebody has a 60% plus mortality in one year and they survive that one year, that means four people, 40% left. Again, a 60% mortality. Again, a 60% mortality. This identifies a cohort which is 95 to 99% likely to be gone within three years. How often do we actually explain that to families? Uh, when it comes a little closer, it gets more and more accurate, uh, uh, even in non-oncology. But as I said, a little further out, it we are in the range of 50 to 60%. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, this is yet another paper which came out from Taiwan and Look at the numbers, 21,000. And they could also identify these same trajectories and give figures and give criteria. Um, so let me look at the fourth patient. And this is uh, a 45-year-old male who developed uh, a brainstem stroke. We attempted, we tried a basilar artery uh, thrombectomy. But it failed. 
and he was stuck on the ventilator with a fairly large uh, infarct in the brain stem and uh, as it turned out uh, because they were not really that well off uh, they started to run out of funds and literally the wife was on one side the rest of the family was on the other including her brothers his brothers um and eventually a tracheostomy and pleg were placed after 19 days because we held off we had given them the option of extubating without a tracheostomy but finally we went ahead and did the tracheostomy he stayed on because he had more episodes of infection finally transferred to a small nursing home and passed away 3 months later uh so if you look at the last trajectory that i showed you where somebody can come into an icu we have again we get options of making these decisions right in the beginning uh we may in some patients decide about brain death but we do have this opportunity in between before we put in a tracheostomy of doing what is called a palliative extubation unfortunately not many people are aware that this is possible because after uh, one year when somebody is in a persistent vegetative state withdrawal is very very difficult and i'm going to quickly skip through this because this is not really important for you right so when we reach this kind of stage remember that it is important for us to undertake what is termed as serious illness communication before the middle of the 20th century diagnosis therapeutics and prognosis were three equally important functions but as medical treatments improved our skill of prognosis declined and as i told you earlier prognostication consists of both foreseeing and foretelling foretelling has to combine honesty accuracy and optimism using con- communication skills and Uh, remember that if you do not commit to foretelling actually your foresight also tends to atrophy so it's very important for us to again undertake prognostication and uh, it's a skill that we just have to learn uh when we need to begin this kind of conversation we are actually uh discussing three overlapping uh concepts the first is goals of care uh th- this is basically uh, a doctor's responsibility you have to educate your patient and family about what is feasible what is not feasible uh this has to be elaborated over multiple visits and this is in addition to treatments now once you have done uh, and and this actually is a uh, effectively talking about whether somebody uh would want to prolong life at all costs or somebody doesn't want to suffer or somebody who wants to uh spend time with family rather than in hospital so on these are things that have to be discussed when you document this information and make it actionable this becomes advanced care plan this term includes living wills or advanced medical directives and the most important component is to choose a proxy decision maker who takes over as a substitute and the patient cannot uh, the thing about this is this whole issue needs to be legally valid which it is in india but it also needs to be backed by public policy if you remember uh, it's now absolutely clear that you need to take consent from patients who are going in for surgery and that is a document which is there on the front of our hospital files think about a document like this being at the front of your hospital file if you are beyond a certain age uh this is something that actually happens in the united states now once you've gone through this depending on how the patient uh, condition is you combine patients or family inputs in terms of values and preferences our inputs in terms of prognosis and feasible choices to make appropriate in the moment decisions so remember these three terms goals of care advanced care planning 
and shared decision making. These are terms that in, in uh, palliative care we often use. If you do it right, it improves patient's quality of life with sense of control over one's last days. It reduces the burden on surviving family members and it obviously reduces the stress on the system. The challenges are that for the patient, there's a fear of death and from the clinician side, there's basically a lack of time. Unfortunately, it's not often done. Uh, you can't blame families for that because they can't, they don't know this. But clinicians do not see it or see it and ignore it. But I feel most often don't know how to handle it. And as I said earlier, if you do not undertake and learn how to foretell, your foresight will atrophy. Again, let me go on this and let me move into the last segment of this. So how do we know when a person is actively dying? We've, we've gone through say, a patient where we know that the last days are approaching. And it's now important to take the patient and the family through the last stages. Uh, can I uh, stop at this point and take any questions if there are any? Because the next stage is, of course, active dying and so on. Are there any questions? about prognosis and uh, all this decision-making that I've spoken about. Anybody wants to unmute and ask? Hello? Uh, no questions in our chat box, still no, sir. So okay. if anybody would I'll, want to unmute at this moment. I'll give you a minute. <laughs> No? Okay, so let's go on. So how do we know when a person is actively dying? Now, these are purely clinical symptoms and signs. So active dying is, is termed the hours or days preceding death during which time the patient's physiological functions wane. Uh, output goes down, eating, consciousness all goes down. And it's our important duty to prepare the family and caregivers for the natural process of dying. Because anticipatory guidance actually helps them a lot. You need the uh, uh, multidisciplinary and holistic care and in fact your care extends to after death also. Now before active dying is a stage called pre-active dying and months to weeks before death the patient starts to withdraw physically and psychosocially. Ambulation goes down, there's less interaction, oral intake goes down, occasional incontinence sets in and you remember the the indicators that I told you about, which are, as I said, most marked for oncology, but actually can be picked up everywhere. Once active dying begins, uh, the key clinical sign is altered sensory. Delirium comes up. So this can be episodic. And this is followed by alterations in vital signs, together with decreased oral intake and decreased urine output. Typically, uh, we ask families to monitor uh, usually the diaper. And uh, typically, if somebody is, is passing less than urine less than four times a day, three, two times a day, then you know that uh, they've stopped. The kidneys are practically packed up. Um, imminent death is when vital signs are consistently deteriorating. So breathing becomes irregular. There's an inability to swallow secretions. So there are secretions pulled and you get the death rattle. Uh, hemodynamic changes may occur, may be obvious. The face becomes sallow and uh, the mouth becomes slack. And probably for me, the sign that really identifies it is gasping. Now, how do you identify gasping? Because different people have different movements. Typically, it's the mandible that starts to move. So watch out for this. If you see somebody is breathing in an odd fashion and the mandible is moving, you're looking at perhaps agonal respiration. And the goals in caring for the dying in the last period is to ensure comfort, make end of life peaceful and dignified. Uh, make the memory of the dying process as positive as possible. Uh, focus on com comfort by managing symptoms. Uh, you have to review drug charts. 
uh, with anticipatory medication dosing and manage refractory symptoms. But ideally, this should not be done in the intensive care unit. There are some challenges that we have to face. And early on, probably the major challenge is nutrition and hydration. Uh, the individual concerned has a diminishing appetite, aversion to food, nausea, may have stomatitis and pharyngitis. And what families do not understand is that because this is part of a natural process, clinically assisted nutrition and hydration with feeding tubes do not enhance survival or quality of life. If you put in a rice tube and the patient is still conscious, it will increase agitation. You will need to restrain them and you can end up with either worsening ulcers or even aspiration. Uh, in fact, they really do not reduce the risk of aspiration. So you have to make decisions about artificial hydration, uh, especially if something is already in place, like a percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy. You review rate or volume according to individual need so that you avoid overhydration at the end of life. Typically, one liter per day is enough. What we recommend instead is what is termed careful hand feeding. Uh, provide food items that the patient likes. The food may be mashed. And it basically has to be done spoon by spoon. And uh, you watch cues from the patient. You can alleviate symptoms of thirst with good mouth care and ice pieces or lubrication of the lips. But what is important is to make the family understand that uh, they are not eating because their systems are going down. And it's not that the systems are going down because they are not eating. And that's something that uh, lay people often find difficult to understand. Then you look at all the medicines that the patient is on. Stop all medicines that are not required for symptom control. Important medicines that need to be continued or are required can be given subcutaneously. Uh, remember that IV antibiotics are pointless. Uh, aspirin and statins are drugs that are for the next decade, not for the next few hours. Uh, vitamins, obviously. Oral hypoglycemic medications we usually stop. And rather than even give an insulin, you can probably monitor sugars. But typically, uh, these are individuals where the sugars start to decline. And uh, psychiatric medicines need to come out. Now, end-of-life care symptoms that bother the patient and family, the first is pain, then is delirium, incontinence, dyspnea, nausea, and vomiting. And we'll look at some of these. If you need to treat them, remember that probably the most appropriate route is subcutaneous, though intravenous, sublingual, all these others can be used depending on your situation and your own uh, experience. Pain is the most common symptom. The presentation is varied. And if the patient is not able to speak, you use a validated scale for people who are not fully conscious. Uh, uh, this is pain and is used in dementia. And uh, you basically uh, look for non-verbal indicators like grimacing, moaning, uh, withdrawal, and so on. And you have to anticipate and treat this effectively. So you need access to opioids. And the reliable route that is preferred is subcutaneous. You may need to titrate it rapidly in severe pain. If somebody is agitated, delirious, the first thing you have to do is rule out these big three. Retention, constipation, pain. Uh, then, of course, you look at the environment and you take care of non-pharmacologic means. Uh, uh, one of the first things that you do is remove anticholinergics, which could be adding to the delirium. Uh, put on glasses, increase natural light. You can even try ambulating, remove tubes, stop unnecessary noise, and protect the patient's sleep. Uh, this is especially difficult in an ICU. If all of this is tried and doesn't work, then haloperidol is the treatment of choice. And uh, uh, haloperidol is not a drug that people like very much, but it, it does work. Uh, benzodiazepines can be activating, can worsen delirium, and should be avoided. What about breathlessness? There are four basic principles. You correct the correctable, 
use air movement on the face to improve symptoms, reduce the perception of dyspnea with morphine or anxiolytics, and an intolerable refractive uh, breathlessness that you might need to use palliative sedation. Um, again, in nausea and vomiting, uh, reverse the reversible. So constipation, hypokalemia, and hypocalcemia are the big three, uh, especially in oncology. And uh, uh, the first line drugs that we use here are metoclopramide, odansetron, and even haloperidol. Uh, adjuvant drugs that can be used are dexamethasone, and second line drugs are uh, even olanzapine has been used. Mm, what about the death rattle? Now, the death rattle is something that bothers the family more than obviously the patient. The patient is departing. And the family has to be told that this is not causing any uh, distress to the patient. Uh, it may either be type 1, which means it's in the pharynx, or it may be in the bronchial, in the bronchial tree. Uh, the management ideally is non-pharmacological, so repositioning, uh, removing the secretion by a finger with a gauze piece, and suctioning should be avoided because it is uncomfortable. It only secretes, the sim stimulates more secretions. If needed to do pharmacologically, then glycopyrrolate and myosin can be used. Um, for the nurses, what's important is to take care of the mouth, prevent pressure sores, and it's important to put in a Foley's catheter uh, if needed. Um, sometimes uh, people may even need a manual evacuation of feces. As you prepare for the end, there are the commonest mode in, is that the patient stops breathing and the heartbeat stops. But there are two other modes that you have to remember because they can be pretty dramatic and at times even scary. The first is often in neurology, but also in non neurological illnesses, are seizures at the end. The first thing is to prevent harm, do not force objects into the mouth. You're obviously, if at the, you're at, I mean, if the patient is at the end, then you have to ask for subcutaneous midazolam or uh, an anti-epileptic drug like even uh, Gardnal can be used. Uh, even uh, 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 Valproate can be uh, uh, given uh, subcutaneously, though I'm not sure if all preparations can be used, but typically we will use uh, midazolam or Gardnal. And uh, if the patient's family is prepared, then you understand that this is a patient who will gradually become unconscious, quiet, and will stop going. The other scary one is a blowout hemorrhage. Oral magnets can infiltrate the neck arteries, and eventually it can cause the carotid artery to give way. This has to be discussed in advance. And when this happens, uh, you I mean, if there's a palliative care person on the spot, they actually stay back to see that this is finished. So you apply steady pressure with dark towels, preferably green, so that blood is not seen, and then you sedate the patient quickly with midazolam, etc., until the patient effectively exsanguinates and passes away. Now, if symptoms are refractory, this is especially true of pain, then you might need to use water strong palliative sedation. Palliative sedation. Uh, the intent is to provide comfort and to provide sleep. Uh, the process of death dying is continued, but obviously death may be hastened because of this sedation. Uh, unlike euthanasia, where the intent is to terminate life and the natural process is overtaken. So uh, although these two sometimes seem similar uh, in palliative care, palliative sedation is an accepted concept. Uh, after that, the family goes through bereavement and grief. Now, grief is the natural distress. Mourning is the outward expression of grief. And everyone will experience grief differently based on culture, religion, the nature of loss, whether it is sudden death or expected death, and the relationship to the deceased. Grief can even be anticipatory in expectation of a loss. But for us, we distinguish these three clinical entities which we need, which we have to recognize and tackle. Acute grief is the one that occurs immediately and it typically declines over a period of seven months. 
eventually this grief gets integrated into one's uh, daily life and outlook uh, because you understand the finality and the consequences of the loss now if grief response persists for an extended period of time this has been defined as 6 months or 12 months after the loss and it exceeds expected social or cultural norms uh, then we call it complicated grief and this is where you might need a psychiatrist to help treat now uh, sorry i am going to move a little quickly further right so there is one more issue that i would like to quickly cover and that is that much of end of life care policy uh in india is in a state of flux and this partly is because the medical profession really doesn't get involved how much time do i have hello sir so, so you can take like um anyways this is a most important top one of the most important topics so okay. our session i'll take another have... 10 10 to 15 minutes more then uh, is there anything else or we have just there is a, a question there is a case presentation left Uh, okay. so that's also somewhat so why don't we uh, okay, I'll, I'll quickly five finish. to 10 minutes okay that 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 right Thank you, so sir. so one of the things that we actually have a problem with is that the medical profession generally shies away from these issues and if you ask lay people they think this is because of perverse incentives we make money out of letting people die in icus what doctors feel is that this is because of a lack of legal clarity because there are no clear regulatory requirements which say thou shalt thou shalt not and so on and more importantly there is a fear of criminal charges uh, i have shown you that prognosis is not very easy to establish but you can learn how to do it. what i believe and what i think most people in palliative care believe is that the reason why indian doctors don't get into this is because they have not been trained in this whole area at all prognostication communication skills palliative care end of life care when you are completely bereft of any training you are obviously going to be hamstrung now uh, remember the four pillars of ethics that we have to follow i am not going again into the details because that's a little tricky uh, we have a legal framework for end of life care which begins with the constitution of india uh goes through all the common law which means the judgments that have come out on this and professional guidelines <clears throat> these three are important to understand because there's a fair amount of legal clarity that is already there which people are not too aware of uh i have been involved in this issue since about 2011 uh first with the aruna shanbagh case which actually began the process of decriminalizing this whole decision making it made sure that if you were to take these decisions nobody could file an fir against you at the most it could be a civil suit and uh, let me tell you abroad most of the litigation in end of life care is actually in the reverse direction it is for what is called wrongful life when somebody is resuscitated against their wishes for us the most important uh, landmark is the judgment of 9th of march 2018 it is called the common cause judgment and this makes one point very clear <clears throat> a competent person who has come of age has a right to refuse specific treatment or all treatment or an all opt for an alternative treatment even if this entails a risk of death you can use the emergency principle only when it is not practicable to obtain the patient's consent but where a patient has already made a valid advance directive which is free from reasonable doubt and specifying that he or she does not wish to be treated then such directive has to be given effect to this is the law of the land uh putting it into application obviously is trickier uh but remember that there are enough practice guidelines that our societies have put out the most important are these this end of life care policy and guidelines that were put out by the indian society of critical care medicine and the indian association of palliative care together way back in 2014 uh after this judgment so 2014 those guidelines 2018 this judgment 
some more documents have come out. Uh, Kasturba Hospital, Manipal has this document called Blue Maple. Uh, end of life care uh, uh, policy in AIMS is a document which is available in the public space and you can download it and use those forms. Uh, the ICMR, I was part of the group that wrote up the do not attempt resuscitation guidelines and uh, our group, uh, you will see it on the Pallium India website, has also put together advanced medical directives, a basic uh, uh, document for India. Uh, when you decide to withdraw care, one of the things that we insist on is that it should be ideally backed by documented hospital policy. There has to be consensus on futility and prognosis amongst involved consultants. Uh, consultants. Uh, if the patient is competent, then the patient decides next if there is a written advanced medical directive that is next in order. And if neither of these two is present, then you take the surrogates and uh, 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 take them into, uh, I mean, you have to discuss it with them before you can make this decision. And document the way this decision is made so that it is signed off by the appropriate surrogates and three consultants. Ideally, the hospital should be doing a post facto audit of this whole process. Uh, if you look at the advanced medical directive that is up on the Pallium India website, it's pretty simple and easy to follow. Uh, we based it on the 2018 judgment. And again, uh, we have uh, put down the three situations where it would become applicable. Basically, an individual, we call it a living will because it comes into operation and the patient is still living, but can no longer communicate his or her decision. And we require this to be uh, supported by a panel of three doctors. And uh, we identify the life-sustaining treatments which you can cross off and say you do not want. And uh, uh, it needs to be countersigned by two witnesses. As of now, to make it enforceable, it needs to be signed before a judicial magistrate first class. Please understand what I'm saying. To make it enforceable. But if it is signed off, if the family supports it, if there are two witnesses, then we believe that it is valid. So there is a distinction. And uh, obviously, this is something that is not yet explored. But we believe that a doctor who takes this into account will be well protected. Uh, yes, but if the doctor says the magistrate signature is not there and I'm going to tear this up, well, perhaps you may not be able to take any action against you. I'm going to stop at this point and uh, take questions now or after the case. Maybe we'll do the case also. It's a uh, and yeah, then okay. we'll go. Um, okay. Thank Bye. you Bye. very much for such an extensive and you know, it, it's it's uh, something that all of us so many gray areas are bound to be there, but you have made sure that you've given enough examples and all solved all the queries also. So really, really a big thank you. And uh, we'll go ahead with the case. And then that's also somewhat related to one of your cases, something like that. So after okay, that, good. we could have the discussion. Yeah, and I promise to, I'll join with the mobile okay. so you can also see Thank me. you. Thank <laughs> you very much. Right, let's go on to the case. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, this is Dr. Shivran Singh. Um, can you go to the case? Okay. Uh, this is a 41 year old, uh, the age of the patient is 41 year old gentleman. Uh, diagnosed with cerebral vascular accident with acute impact in the left ACA territory and also superior aspect of cerebellar hemisphere with acute coronary syndrome. It was the NSEMI anterior and inferior wall along with acute kidney injury, and uh, he was an old case of dilated cardiomyopathy, secondary to alcohol, alcoholic liver disease, uh, and mods with refractory shock and systemic hypertension. Actually, the patient uh, came to us with complaints of weakness of the right upper limb and lower limb in six hours, and uh, altered tensorium in six hours. Uh, he was apparently normal six hours ago when he developed uh, weakness of the right upper limb and lower limb, 
uh, which the caretaker describes as a fall to the ground backwards when he was playing with the kids followed by uh, loss of consciousness which lasted for around 5 to 8 minutes and uh, he regained consciousness after which he was in uh, altered sensorium so when he was brought he was in altered sensorium there was no history of seizures or urinary or bowel uh, incontinence or any slurred speech no other history of chest pain breathlessness palpitation fever vomiting loose stools or burning respiration and uh, he is a no case of uh, systemic hypertension uh, uh, since 2 months and he also gives a history of uh, old uh, cva that was one year back but there was no neurological deficit and also uh, dcm details of which is not uh, was not available and uh, he was consume he used to consume alcohol sorry what is uh, dcm a uh, dilated cardiomyopathy oh sorry yeah, yeah of course of course yeah. and uh, uh, he consumes alcohol uh, for 15 years and his last drink was one month back and he was also a smoker so when he presented he was uh, disoriented with a gcf of gcf of 7 by 15 he came his bp was 130 by 90 and pulse rate was 94 respiratory rate was 18 cycles per minute and the saturation was uh, low around some 80 uh, when he presented and 99% was maintaining with 10 liters of oxygen ictus was present and there was pedal edema uh, and uh, respiratory system uh, there were crepitations uh, present in uh, bilateral intracapillary areas and the inter uh sorry intraaxillary areas other than that uh, he was disoriented the power was 0 by 5 in the right upper limb and lower limb uh, and 4 by 5 in the left upper limb and lower limb and reflexes uh, were absent uh, in the right side and uh, left side it was present with flexor right side extent of anta and was uh, reduced on the right side and left it was normal so investigations uh, Um, complete blood count the hemoglobin was 13.7 but the total count was very much raised to 16500 uh, with the neutrophilic pattern 75 and the uh, leukocytes were 22 platelets were 1.73 and his urea was very much raised with 110 and creat was uh, 2.0 and even the lft was deranged with the uh, scod was 347 and acpt 370 and uh, alp was 160 and albumin was only 2.1 and uh, we had done a drop uh, drop i level also to 72 nanograms per deciliter uh, like i mentioned there was inferior uh, and uh, uh, anterior and inferior wall involvement and uh, urine retin was normal his electrolytes were fine uh, crp was mildly reduced for 42 and the rbs was uh, okay and uh, he was started on injection meropenem metrogel dexa and manitol and lasix when uh, Yeah, Carvel and vitamin C, uh, heparin and pantoprazole, thiamine and digoxin, and vitamin K and syrup diphalac. Uh, uh, actually, one more thing I wanted to mention is uh, when we started on when he presented, he was 130 by 90, and uh, later he went into hypotension, and he was actually on dual inotropes. Uh, noradrenal was going on, and dobutamin was also going on. Uh, from the disorientation. Uh, he had Jesus drop, so we had to intubate him. Uh, intubated, and he was mechanically ventilated, and he was also on inotrope support. Uh, psychosocial aspects: uh, he's a uh, the patient is a coolie by occupation. He has two daughters. Uh, he was not in a very good relationship with his wife or the daughters, and he was abusing uh, her after acting. Uh, and there was also financial instability present. The wife was taking care of the daughters, and he was also working. and uh, during the hospital stay his uh, wife actually does not come to visit uh, and even the daughters also doesn't come to visit him uh, his mother is the one who took care of the patient in the hospital and the mother took some loans uh, for the hospital bill after 3 days of icu stay they were not able to afford any bills and uh, she was not getting any support from the family or the wife or the relatives uh, like i said the, uh, along with that we had uh, injection norad infusion and also dobutamin sorry i forgot to mention uh, and he was intubated and mechanically ventilated and the main concern is the patient who was intubated and mechanically ventilated due to low gcs and uh, due to financial constraint the patient could not continue any treatment uh summary is he is a 41 year old gentleman a case of uh, cva with acute coronary syndrome and aki and dilated cardiomyopathy alcoholic liver disease not fresh shock and uh, systemic hypertension 
uh, intubated, mechanically ventilated, and on inotropes. So the main the question that I had is the patient caretaker did not want to go to any other hospital for further treatment. And the dilemma persisted for extubating the patient and also to remove all other supportive measures and to take the patient home. So the main problem here was the financial constraint as in, and uh, uh, he was, the recovery was like, he was going into refractive shock, even with the increased anotropes and the supportive measures, he was not improving. So the dilemma was like, should we extubate the patient and send the patient home? Uh, even referring to the host, another hospital where uh, financial, because the main re, uh, concern was financial country, but the attenders were not willing to take the patient anywhere. So they wanted to take the patient directly home. Uh, so this was the thing. All right. So uh, who is going to discuss it? Um... Uh, and finally, what happened with the patient was, uh, uh, after three days, uh, he actually passed away here itself. Okay. Uh, they stayed for another three days and he passed away. So was he ventilated all, everything continued as you mentioned or what happened? Yes, ma'am. We had continued. Irrespective of all that, uh, he was not maintaining. He went into hypotension again and uh, he passed away. Right. Okay. So uh, anybody has any... Uh, That's what normally we 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 uh, like. Well, normally, what we do is we ask the uh, participants to either uh, yes, unmute please. and unmute and come into the discussion, or they may type in the uh, chat box. One of them. So let me have a look. And so far, no, nothing is in the chat. Either like say they can either they can unmute and. You can go through like uh, we can go through the uh, the discussion points uh, okay. the, as the caretaker did not want and what is what are the options or how could you manage how, how differently you could have managed okay so when you come into this kind of a situation uh, and obviously here when you're looking at prognosis you're not just looking at the medical prognosis you're also looking at the uh, psychosocial background because uh, at the end of it uh, giving somebody severely disabled back to the family uh, in this kind of situation doesn't really make sense so at the same time uh, you are it's uh, inappropriate to not provide acute care so yeah. what we the term that we use for this is called a time limited trial Effectively, a time-limited trial in the ICU is a period of three to five days uh, during which we do our best to turn the situation around and then have a family meeting where we discuss the likely outcomes. And then at that point, uh, typically what I would do in this situation is first talk about a time-limited trial for three days. Mm. At the end of those three days, uh, the DNAR is now a legally valid document. If the patient is declining, I would ask for a DNAR. So even though the patient is intubated on the ventilator, ventilator uh, he is not for cardiac resuscitation if there is any arrest. Yes. Okay. Uh, take it forward another two days. And I understand that uh, there will be financial constraints. The family will not be able to pay, but uh, we have to negotiate during this period of instability. And my own suggestion would be that maybe another uh, a withdrawal might be discussed at the end of another two days. By, by then, uh, if things are not going to turn around or they are not going to turn around into any kind of a uh, reasonable uh, outcome, mm. then uh, again, the process that I outlined uh, basically means that three consultants have to agree that this is now futile. And there is another point here. Uh, the surrogate effectively is his wife, not his mother. She has to be brought into the discussion because for proceeding with this decision making, you do require her on board. 
even though mm-hmm. she is uh, effectively estranged, you still do have to have. In fact, if you look at the surrogate hierarchy that the AIMS document puts out, it is spouse followed by adult children. Now, maybe the children are minors, followed by parents. Mm-hmm. So you have to take into account all of this. And I would probably do that at the end of about five days. I'm sorry, I kind of jumped in with an answer because to save no, time. No, no, it's, it's, uh, it's the best. I have one query in what you've said. If you're finding, yeah. if you're having difficulty, like if she's not turning up, what are the other options available? How do you go about with that? Because see, she is not happy with him. So with the financial burden, so is there any... Uh, so any the last, options? yeah, so the, the last, uh, uh, no, I think I would still make all efforts to get her on board, at least for this decision making. But uh, we do use the person who's taking care of the patient in the hospital and who's always there as the effective surrogate if, if you have no other uh, surrogates. Uh-uh, that's last choice. If you're not yeah, getting that's her, the last you take the mother out. Yeah. Just, I thought, is, just to know if there's yeah. any other way of getting her. Yeah, yeah. Like, do you get the help of police or something like that? Is that possible or what happens? Was my Maybe just not. Quick? Maybe not, not okay. but, uh, mm-hmm. but uh, I mean, you could take the mother as the only effective surrogate available. Just a query, I thought, just to yeah, get yeah, some time. Right. Good, good that you asked that. So we can... <laughs> like you explaining was a better, see, this time limited is something <laughs> uh, I have also been telling because um, is something like generally also, even when uh, not exactly in this uh, context, whenever you have someone in ICU, time uh, like 24 hours or uh, 48 hours, you use all that and see the response. And if there's no response, rather than going on and on with it, this is something which is used and it is positive. And then it, it is accepted well by the family also because they also will not have the um, feeling that nothing has been done. So we have done everything. And in spite of that, there's no response. So we, we save ourselves and that gives enough satisfaction and content for the family also to come to some terms. Quite right. Because when you say that we don't know, we don't know how long it will take, we don't know what is going to happen, that is where everybody gets extremely agitated. Mm. When you negotiate for a time-limited trial and say, we will discuss this again at the end of three days. For three days, we will do the best possible. And then we'll come back again. They accept it. And it works also. It, it gives yeah, very yeah. many uh, information. And uh, I, as uh, all through, I have gone through that. Uh, I have been an intensivist for nearly 15, 20 years. So that is something uh, very, very useful. And patients will not, they will be happy to have a discussion with us. Quite right. Any questions about the previous presentation? Anything? Thanks for the compliments, but any questions, anybody? Hmm. Advanced, just I have a query. Uh, sure, go ahead, the advanced directives and things, how, uh, how actively is done? And then is it real? Because that would be very useful. And all your cases, what you brought, there's something because most of us will have at least eight to 10 people in our own family in that age group. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say I, I've had like nearly 20 and now I have 10 yet. So, <laughs> uh, uh, so that is very common. And I've had all uh, people who are in like your one, two, three cases I have had at home. <laughs> so that's very common. Uh, I wouldn't say everyone will be, it's not only me, most of them will have. So how effective and things are there? Like are people... Willing to get that done? Yeah. So mm-hmm. so what I do is, in the OPD, uh, I usually don't bring this up in the first consultation. But when I know that this is a, a situation where it's a progressive disease, then in the second consultation, I usually bring this topic up. And I say that uh, we have this document. Would you like to look at it? And uh, if so, please uh, take it home. And next mm-hmm. time when you come, uh, we will talk about it. 
and uh, you do it in front of the family and invariably the caregiver is relieved especially if it's a younger individual they are immediately relieved that this this topic has been brought out and it is put out in the open and it is our business to you know, bring this up so uh, you can look at this document it's there on the website just download it use it and uh, as as i say uh, if the family accepts it and if it is countersigned by two witnesses uh, in the faqs you can figure out what the witnesses and all that uh, ideally you should get it countersigned by a judicial magistrate first class but we hope that that requirement will go away till then mm -hmm. if you want if somebody really wants to be really full proof yeah you can do that but i think that if the family is in support and if there are two witnesses it is as good as it gets because the judicial magistrate getting in difficult that be an easy job because no, getting no, those no. ah that is why that was the my query without that will be a better of choice because uh, an 80 year old or someone yeah. who has who is willing to make this decision and especially very many elders whom i have known like in your first or second case it was very clear the husband wife had made that is something i've heard very much in my family they'll be mm. very clear in what they but if you force them to get a judicial magistrate that may be a big task for them to get it done in that way mm. so that happen. is something we if that goes away will be a blessing for them but until it goes away don't mm. stop using it use it without ah, so it's it. not a must no again i'm i'm mm. uh if you want an enforceable document huh. meaning uh, say at the end of it if the doctor doesn't listen and you want to file a criminal case okay. against the doctor then mm -hmm. maybe a magistrate signed document would mm -hmm. be more useful but if you are all you're concerned about is making sure that the family is clear about what has to be done then the paper Both is all that matter doctor will accept it yeah I that's it say, yeah i so would you... say that why do you make your life more difficult uh, yeah. if they, if someone if someone knows palliative care he will not argue with it it's given to me i think I... more and more people will accept it once we yes. start putting these documents out mm -hmm. it's giving dignity to the person that's how i have always took it as see yeah, family everything is important but patient is the point of best interest for us and giving dignity to them all through their life is our duty Absolutely. that's how to be taken as good very very informative it was and and especially the advanced directive i think what you have shown in the palim that that was uh, really self explanatory and has everything in it yes please download it everybody yes as i said that uh, we have had the expert so we have we have no uh, no queries i think that that is one of the uh, reasons okay. why because we had it from you who is the master of it for india and then what else do we need thank you so much really really it was such a big pleasure and privilege to have you anything now else is Ori, there the box stories will come okay. only when we start practicing ma'am ah yes yes exactly that's true and uh, when when all of you start uh, practicing yeah. and one thing you have palim india always there to help you it's a resource you ah, come to the resource. website look for things Correct. yeah see it's like a notion not one or two it has got everything in it every session throws more light to us so i would say all if you can go ahead and start and then you know very well that someone is there to back you up and any time no, so many contacts we are getting the input we are, we are getting the knowledge to practice once we practice only we get lot of queries now we are only learning from the lecture when you do and see cases all this you will use see your uh, knowledge will then be put into practice through your skill and practice that is why if you know have the knowledge your practice is going to be easier right so mm. are we done we are past 6:30 nearly ah yes yes that's all thank you very much once again thank you uh, thank you for
having Thank me over. Thank you very much for such an informative uh, session. Now, over to you, Sri Priya. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Roop. We could understand from We didn't the... see him till, till the last. We didn't see him. Oh, no. Sorry. <laughs> oh, yes, I'll have to yes, sign no. in again. <laughs> please, please. Okay. <laughs> Till the time to... he signs in, uh, of course, we do understand that you had Look, Let me in... see, let me see, let me see. I'm <laughs> signing in from my mobile phone. So, till the time he joins us back, uh, it is very true what Dr. Mapati had said that what you are learning, we could be happy to support you through the entire journey because at the end of the day, you have to make the first step to start a journey. Each beautiful journey begins with a single step. And we do hope that Parivindya serves at the first step towards your uh, service to humanity. We do hope that we also become part of that wonderful journey. Uh, I think, Doctor, yes. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, you're a... Yeah, exactly. Oh, thank you, Doctor Umapati, for reminding. We couldn't have <laughs> let him let him go without seeing him, isn't it? Yeah, it's we, a pleasure. We are all man. waiting yeah. to see you. That yes. was uh, it was a privilege to see you. So nice of you. Uh, we thank you once again in person. It's like uh, that is the importance of seeing you. Really, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for joining in. And I believe that uh, this end of life care might have been the start of an enlightening journey for every one of you. At least uh, some new knowledge you all might have got from this uh, session. With that positive note, this is Sri Priya, along with uh, Dr. Ruk Gursani and Dr. Ratha Venkatesan, signing off from the Tips Echo Hub. See you in the next session with another different topic and an eminent faculty. Till then, everyone, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.